Welcome to Almost Here, Round the Corner of Future Technology podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies, ways to transform our lives for better or worse, are the focus of this podcast. Almost Here means these technologies are now here and starting to be used, or just around the corner, from Bitcoin to artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Podcast. My guest is Jonah Meyerberg, uh, CTO and co-founder of uh, Desktop Metal. We're talking about uh, 3D printing that they're doing. So, Jonah, how are you today? I'm great, Rich. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Uh, tell me about, um, you know, a little bit about 3D printing in general, and then uh, the type that you're working on and, you know, the peculiarities of it. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so, Desktop Metal is a, um, is a company really with one mission, and that's to make metal 3D printing more accessible to engineers and manufacturers than it has been in the past. And, um, and the really re- reason behind that is because metal 3D printing is not something new, but it is um, something that has had this uh, kind of this barrier to entry um, around it. Uh, as a mechanical engineer, I myself, you know, use 3D printing extensively and have for the past 20 years but um, I never was given the ability to drive a metal 3D printer. And that's really because of the complexity, um, the expense, the dangers of metal 3D printing. So um, we at Desktop Metal have developed ways to uh, reduce that complexity, to reduce the cost, um, and make it um, so easy to print metal parts that, uh, that anyone can do it. In fact, um, we allow them, we enable them to do it right at their desk, right where the engineer works. Oh, wow. Um, so what the, I mean, you think of metal, I don't know, the only thing I would think of maybe is like the Terminator and liquid metal. You know, how do you, how do you print in metal? I've seen, you know, plastic, the PLA, you know, 3D printers that raster back and forth and, you know, squirt out like liquefied plastic, but how does um, metal 3D printing work? Yeah, yeah, no, so great question. Um, so metals um, have, you know, significant differences from polymers and it's, you know, it's not just their strength. You know properties and um, and their uh, you, you know the 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 you know the the mass properties that we know about, but in fact the um, the printability the properties that we care about in printability are very different between a um, you know a, a metal and a plastic. So when you look at polymer three D printing, polymer three D printing takes advantage of uh, a, a plastic's ability to soften, basically turn into a you know a sticky, viscous uh, form, and then um, extrude that form into the shape you want it, and then let it cool, um, and it comes back to its hard shape again. So you know, its plastics go from very hard to you know nice and soft, and have this working temperature that you can uh, print them with. Now metals do not. So metals typically go from a solid to a liquid. And there's no in between, like high viscous uh, form that you can, um, you know, kind of print in. So, uh, you know, like you look at the Terminator, the, the T3 Terminator, which has this liquid metal. Um, in fact, liquid metal is not uh, very easy to print with. Um, so, what we have done is developed a way to print the metal in its solid form by using metal powder, and we bind the metal powder together with a plastic. And the whole metal plastic composite flows just like a polymer printer would. And then you remove that polymer or a portion of it and you use a sintering technique. And that is a solid state sintering technique. So the metal never turns into its liquid form. And all of the metal powder bonds together with each other and drives out all the plastic and all the porosity. And you end up with a solid metal part um, that, uh, you know, otherwise you wouldn't know was printed. So the plastic entrains the metal particles. You print it, you get it where it wants to go, and then you do the sintering process, and the plastic is driven out. The metal bonds together, and you end up with a, just a solid metal part. You got it. You got it. You, with no trace of any plastic, plastic ever being there in the first place, and the grain structure grows larger than the powder particles themselves. So essentially the history of the part is erased, and you uh, end up with a with a 3D printed metal part. That's amazing. Huh. Are there um, other common metal uh, 3D printing methods, or is it just sintering? Are there other ones out there? Maybe even if you don't use them, just to make a note of what else is out there. 
Yeah, oh, absolutely. So metal 3D printing has been around for uh, about 20 years. And it um, you know, usually consists of uh, firing a laser into a bed of powder. And that laser melts the uh, metal powder locally, um, creating a kind of a solid object. And then you use that laser to draw the profile of that solid object. Um, and then you spread that powder on top of your profile. And you use that laser to draw your solid object again. And you do that over and over and over. Um, now, you're, that, in that process, you're using uh, lasers, which are high-powered, they're dangerous, um, and they, um, you know, they're expensive. And you're using a powder, which is dusty um, and car could be carcinogenic as well as could be um, explosive. So these metal 3D printing processes, although they've existed for 20 years, they've evolved into more factory-based manufacturing processes. So... Um, metal 3D printing, you know, kind of state-of-the-art metal 3D printing of today are these giant machines that you have to wear these bunny suit protective clothing to operate. Um, they are in factories with explosion proofing um, and inert gases. Um, and it's really not something that an engineer in his office, uh, you know, designing parts can, uh, you know, easily operate uh, or really have in the same room as him. Now, if we, rever if we go back in time even further, polymer printers um, started this way. So polymer printers started as giant machines, um, you know, both with uh, stereolithography, um, which is called SLA, which uses a light laser um, to, to cure a polymer resin bath, um, and, and also powdered plastics. So using you know, a very similar process to what I described for metals, but instead a polymer dust or a polymer powder that lasers weld together and create the part. So these printers, um, you know, 30 years ago, uh, were essentially industrial tools that lived in factories. But over the past 30 years, the uh, you know companies, various companies, have taken these technologies and reduced them to a ver to simpler and simpler machines, smaller and smaller machines, um, and less expensive machines. So now polymer printers, you can go to Home Depot and buy and put in your office. Um, these are, you know, a few thousand dollars and, and simple and fast and, and, um, and easy and, most importantly, inexpensive. But these laser-based metal powder processes did not evolve that same way, right? They evolved the other direction into giant machines that sit in factories um, and are very inaccessible to engineers. So what we've done at Desktop Metal is taken metal 3D printing the opposite direction, um, and we've evolved it into these machines that take advantage of polymer printing techniques and bring the technology into the office environment. Yeah, I see why this would be so much more efficient because, you know, I, I imagine myself working as an engineer in a plant. You'd have to go down to a certain area and ask the techs to, you know, to print something that you've designed and it's loud and, like you said, it's dangerous and they do it. And then you have to come back and get the part versus sitting at your desk and you have an idea you just run the machine right there. You could look at it and play with it. So it seems like it'd be a lot more efficient, a lot faster to do it this way. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's funny because when we go back 20 years, um, you know, as a mechanical engineer, I was designing, uh, you know, power tools for Black & Decker. I was designing home electronic products for Bose Corporation. I mean, I was a practicing mechanical engineer. And I, I kind of took what you just said for granted. If I had a part that I wanted to prototype, <clears throat> I had to send it away to the factory to get someone who knew how to make it, make it, right? And even if I wanted it printed, they would have to operate the printers and get it done. So that was just the way things were back then. And, uh, you know, it wasn't unusual. It was just, you know, what you did. And um, we've evolved to today to where we are like an instant gratification type of society, right? We want all the information immediately at the touch of a finger, right, in our smart devices. We want, um, you know, want everything fast and now. And polymer 3D printing has evolved to support that. So just like you described, if you're a designer at your desk and you design a part, you want it now. You don't want to mess around with sending it away for a few days. You want a printer yeah. at your desk that prints it. And plastics allows that, right? We, you can go get a plastics printer and do that. But, you know, now we want metal parts. We want something that functions. So if I want to make a new uh, you know, a truck for my my skateboards, or if I want to make a spare part for something that broke, you know, 
I want to print it and I want it to function and I want it to be made out of the same metal that was used to design it in the first place. Um, and so that's really kind of the mantra. That's the spirit that we designed the desktop metal system in is, you know, hey, you print it yourself. Why why uh, send it away? Yeah, no, that's really cool. It makes total sense. I mean, I'll just go into it a little bit more, but I, I used to work in a you know high-tech factory and to even get time on some of the big machines, you'd have to write an engineering plan and a test plan and you'd have to wait and the technicians sometimes would mess it up and sometimes it could take weeks just to get time on a tool and the tools were like million dollar tools and so this would be like a radical transformation a lot faster a lot easier to do it at your desk yes that's right that's right and i think a lot of prototyping a lot of design happens you know at the engineer's desk like let me just let me just make this and test it myself and see if it you know if it, if it works if it's if i like the design um and the cool thing is that with additive manufacturing and 3D printing, you can start to change the way you design the part. So you can take advantage of printing to create geometry that is not normally, um, you know, able to be created. You know, like some really organic looking parts um, and shapes, um, optimizing for the actual application. So this, you know, we really expect that this is going to help revolutionary, re- revolutionize the design process. But then we asked ourselves, what happens when the designer um, is happy with their design? So they've created a design, they've prototyped it, and they like it. You know, we found out that, you know, does, mechanical engineers design parts just as much for the, um, the application as they do for the manufacturing process. So if you are going to make this part through, you know, metal stamping operation, then you're going to design it to be made out of a flat sheet of steel. Or if you're going to be made, if you're making it to be cast, then you're going to design it with draft angles um, and even um, wall thicknesses, so you don't get hot spots and weird shrinkage. So does, parts are designed as much for manufacturing as they are for final application. So the same is true with 3D printing. When you design these parts for 3D printing, you want to then be able to take them into mass production using 3D printing. So we've introduced a second technology, a second machine called the desktop metal production machine, and that is 100 times faster and is meant to operate in the factory um, and produce these, you know, the same additively manufactured and designed for additive manufacturing parts at a much higher speed for mass production. Yeah, that's really cool. You know, it's, it's funny. I imagine newbie designers, you know, they would used to come in. And they would design something, and then the you know the older people would say you know then you, you can't do it that way. You don't understand how the production line works. But now I bet you, new designers that come in and have all these crazy ideas, they can bring some of them to life with 3D printing because they're not constrained by you said like by the manufacturing process and by the tools themselves and the geometries and the thicknesses, the tolerances. Have you that, noticed any of that? That's right. Yeah. That no, absolutely. That that is exactly right. Um, a mechanical design engineer has to be, v- be very well uh, schooled in manufacturing engineering. They have to know how the parts are, are being made. And, you know, that, that is not going to change. You know, these, these uh, mechanical engineers, the, the, the companies who are the, these uh, initial um, partners of ours who are very interested in additive manufacturing, that's the first thing that they ask, and rightfully slow, rightfully so. Uh, how do you design a part for additive manufacturing? And that itself is going to be a new technique that needs to be learned. Design for additive. What's the best way to print a part? Because there's there's features that will print better. Um, there's features that will sinter better. You can just you can always optimize a part for the manufacturing process. But just like you said, it frees up the engineer to design the part really however um, fits the manufacturing process. And in this case. It gives them freedom to create geometry that is really made, made uh, no other way. Um, and it's a hard, it's a big hurdle for engineers to get over. Like you said, like the old guys will come in and say, no, you don't know how to make a part. You don't know how, to, how a part's made or manufactured, so um, you, know, you need to follow these design rules. Well, the same thing's going to happen now. The engineers say, well, shoot, I don't know how to, manu- I don't know how to design a part for additive manufacturing. Um, so we've begin we've begun to launch these um, tools that our users are using to create parts for 3D printing, um, and one of them is called Live Parts. Live Parts is a software that Desktop Metal developed 
where an engineer can input in the constraints. They can basically say, hey, I want to hold this bracket relative to this bracket. But in between the two, all I know, even to the, in between the two brackets, all I know is that there's going to be some forces. I don't really know what the best geometry is. And so you let the software, you let live parts grow that part in between the two holding points. And the geometry turns out to be very organic in shape, right? It's optimized for the function um, and designed for 3D printing. So you end up with some really cool geometry. Yeah, so I haven't asked you, which is you know, obvious question. What kind of parts are you printing in metal? You know, uh, anything special, anything interesting? You know, what do you see uh, engineers make that uh, you think is really cool or surprises you? Yeah, so the first the first um, questions we get when we inter- inter- um, we interact with a new customer is, hey, I've got a bunch of parts. Can you print these? And um, they're parts that exist already that are um, designed for other manufacturing processes. Like they might be designed to be forged or cast or stamped. And sure, we can print those. But just like any any part, if you change the manufacturing process, you need to change the design. So our, the coolest parts that we're, we're printing are the ones where our customers have redesigned them to be printed. Um, and those are the really cool organic shaped parts, the ones that look like they've been made out of you know, Terminator 3 liquid metal, right? They just have, have this metal flowing from one constraint to the next constraint. Um, and so, uh, you know, they, these could be spare parts for, uh, you know, a bracket when a bracket breaks. It could be, um, you know, a tool uh, that's used in a factory um, or either by, even by an end user. Um, there are so many little applications, and I need to be careful because I love talking about them, but I I know that um, I'm not supposed to talk about some. Some are, are secret. Um, but in general terms, um, we have a lot of automotive customers who are very interested in putting metal parts, printing metal parts for their cars. Um, we have industrial manufacturing partners who print parts for their factory, uh, for their assembly lines, um, and even for their industrial tools. Um, and then we have like consumer electronics companies who are printing parts for you know mobile phones, mobile devices. There are metal parts everywhere. Um, and I think in you know in 10 years, 20 years, we're going to look around the room and we're going to see 3D printed metal parts. Right now, you walk around the world and you don't see any. Even though there's you know a billion dollar business out there of metal 3D printing, you never see metal 3D printed parts right now. That'll change and we'll start to see them everywhere in light fixtures, in mounting brackets, and in furniture. It's going to be really cool. And you said um, you can make a more organic design. So I've seen, I don't know what they were printed with, but I've seen various objects printed with 3D printing, and they start to resemble stuff in nature, um, almost like a, I mean, some things look like almost like a spider web design where you get these complex geometries you can never get with traditional manufacturing. So is there anything in particular you could talk about where you've seen a design that, you would never be possible with normal metal manufacturing that you've seen in 3D printing and talk about what it was used for and maybe some of the metrics, you know, it, it saved 15% weight or it saved, uh, you know, I don't know. It, it was made out of one part instead of 34 parts, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I think you hit it right on the head. Um, all of those um, all those features and uh, reasons to 3D print um, are are what we're starting to see. You know, assembly consolidation, where you might have 50 parts in an assembly and you're able to reduce it down to one simply because you combine all the geometry. And by combining all the geometry, you're eliminating fasteners that you might need uh, or weldments, um, and you're able to take out weight and volume. Um, and so you optimize, I mean, you know, up to, you know, you name it. I mean, we've seen applications where you can pull 90% of the weight out of the part just by 3D printing. Um, and then you're able to create geometry that is impossible to create any other way. And, and a good example of that is the internal geometry. Uh, so imagine you know you, you have a, some sort of a block. Your part has a block, um, and you just needed to have you know these these solid walls. But inside, it doesn't need to be solid. And so we can hollow out the inside uh, and um, and print the part at a fraction of its overall volume and mass um, because we're doing it layer by layer by layer. Um, and so those, you know, you look at maybe like an injection molding tool. An injection molding tool could look nice and simple. It just opens and closes and it has the part um, the part geometry 
that's been machined in it um, from the inside. But if you if you were able to look inside of the injection mold tool, um, most injection mold tools are completely solid steel, and they um, you know you have to get the heat in and out of that solid steel block, which steel is not a good thermal conductor. And so when we print those those injection mold tools, we can print and bury uh, cooling channels in there. And you can flow water or you can flow oil up through these cooling channels that go up real close to where the part is injection molded. And these are called um, conformal cooling channels because they conform to the geometry of the part. And now you can heat and cool the mold very, very quickly. Um, so, the, so even though you can't see that geometry, um, it's in there and it's doing something very, very important. You know, but you you asked about the you know kind of the the organic shapes. Um, yeah, we we love to print you know the parts that look like bones or bone structures. Um, and in fact, our software live parts can help our users to design those uh, bone structures. Uh, and they really do turn out looking like bone because they are um, designed for the application, just like your body is designed for the application. Your, your bones grow where they need to grow, and they don't grow where they don't need to grow. So what kind of products right now um, are you seeing are going to be really revolutionized by metal 3D printing? Uh, you know, maybe ones that we're not doing in metal right now because we can't, but, you know, we can with your system. What do you see as the near-term future of uh, where this is going to go? So it's going to, it's going to go in so many different directions, you know, for, for all these reasons we're talking about. The really cool applications, I think, are going to be in, you know, in weight reduction, in um, overall performance increase, um, in, um, you know, in complexity increase. You know, there's, there's um, some great examples out there already of where, you know, GE has taken, you know, a, a turboprop jet engine that has like 700 some parts and reduced them to 15. Um, and the efficiency has gone up by doing that, of course. Uh, there's antenna examples where, you know, an, uh, an, a very complicated antenna may be made of 100 parts, but you can print it in one part, and it becomes much more effective and efficient and optimized um, because of that. I, I personally come from the world of, um, like, uh, motorsports and Formula One racing, and a lot of the teams you know, who are sponsored by big name automotive companies like, you know, like Mercedes and Formula and um, Ferrari and McLaren, um, they print parts for their cars because they're optimized for performance, but they don't have a clear path on how to get those parts into their road cars. You know, they're very expensive to print a part using the laser powder bed machines that exist today. So with the desktop metal machines, we're able to print at a much lower cost. And so all these automotive companies are looking at the work that they've done in Formula One racing and other racing series and now applying it to the road car. So you can, you can imagine, you know, pumps and linkages and even valves and pistons that were designed for, for racing will make it into the road cars. And that's really exciting. Very cool. So, oh. You said you have your own software. Are you making the printers? Are you making the printers themselves and the software by which people can use the prints? We are, yes. We're making um, the the printers are actually multiple machines. So you know the sintering process involves um, you know both the printing and the sintering, as well as some in between um, processes. So we use our software to link the entire process together. We call it a full stack uh, process in which the user inputs the model and then our software takes over. Okay. So what's on the uh, roadmap for you in the next six months or a year? What new things are you coming out with or what new deployments? Oh, uh, yes. So we're ramping up um, our production of printers right now for our customers. Um, we've, been, um, we've been selling the printer now for about a year and a half. And um, we, so we have a significant backlog of, um, of orders. So we really want to get our customers, uh, you know, fulfilled, get these printers out into our customers' hands as soon as possible. So that's what we're going to be focused on, and supporting them and making sure they run reliably. Um, we're then going to be bringing customers in to run our production machine here in our mini factory that we've built. Um, and this is a mini factory that has um, four production machines, and we can bring customers through, and they can print their parts, exercise the machines, and really get to know what is going to be shipped to them um, over the next year. 
And then we're, you know, we're hopeful to deploy some of these uh, production machines very soon into customers' hands and have them make parts for their customers. Very cool. Well, last question or so. Are there any metals that, uh, what are some of the metals you can print in? Which ones can't you print in? And are there any that you think in the next few years we will be able to print in that we can't yet do? Yeah, yeah. So that's a great question. And, um, and it's really, it's one of the, um, one of the reasons why we, we kind of directed our development into powdered metal sintering. Um, so right now, we print in steels and copper and super alloys. Um, these are all um, known existing powdered metals that have been used for the past you know, 100 years. So powdered metallurgy is not a, uh, is a, not a new science, um, and especially powdered metal sintering is not new either. So there are hundreds of, of engineering alloys that already exist in the powdered form and are very sinterable. And so we have, we have been slotting them in and, and putting them into our printer, and we expect to be able to print almost every single one of those um, you know, powdered metal alloys that exist. Um, so it's really exciting, and it includes you know, really cool alloys like precious metals as well, um, as well as every engineering alloy, engineering steel, you know, the stainless steels, really hard um, tool steels, um, and, um, and even titaniums. It's really, um, you know, a vast, vast, broad um, palette of, of engineering materials. That's great. So, Jonah, what's the best way for interested parties to get in touch? Um, come to our website. We've got an, an amazing amount of information and material and videos. Um, we talk about both products in, in great detail as well as the materials and the process. Um, it's www.desktopmetal.com, and you should be able to find all the information you need as well as um, be able to get in touch with our engineers and our sales team. All right, that's great. Well, Jonah, it's really cool stuff you're working on, and I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Thanks, Rich. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. You have been listening to Almost Here, Around the Corner Future Technology Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Subscribe to this podcast, both to review to discover more future technologies that are poised to transform our lives for better or worse, such as Bitcoin, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more.